this week's Eagle Sports Update. I'm your host, Al Wilman. And I'm Derek Maselli. We'll start right down the street where the EMU gymnastics team took part in the NCAA regionals at Chrysler Center in Ann Arbor on Saturday. Mere fractions of a point separated the Eagles from the two national qualifiers as the green and white finished with a 196.250, a great finish in its own right. Auburn and Stanford, each with scores of 196.525, earned trips to the national championships in Fort Worth on April 15th and 16th. Rachel Slocum, in her stellar junior season, qualified for nationals as an individual. She'll participate in the floor exercises after notching a 9.9 .9 over the weekend. EMU coach Jay Santos, who appeared on the Eagle Sports Update before the season began, was named Regional Coach of the Year, while his wife Jess was named Regional Assistant of the Year. Unfortunately, no awards were given to their son Cooper, which would have completed the family trifecta. Also right down the street, the tennis team remains winless in conference play as the Eagles fell to Ball State 5-2 here at home on Sunday. First in doubles play, the Ball, State, or Ball State's number three duo of Carmen Blanco and Bethany Moore quickly dispatched Renu Sharma and Alejandra Barcello Almoigna 6-1 in the number one spot. Eastern's Clara Sapoyeva and Andrea Martinovska were leading 5-4, but the match went unfinished as Ani Gogvads and Mary Mayrova fell to Peyton Golfer and Audrey Berger 6-4. Eastern's only victories of the day would come in singles play when Anna Valeja defeated Isabel Dohanix in the five spot and Sapoyeva bested golfer with a 7-2 tiebreaker decision. The Eagles fall to 13-3, 0-3 in the MAC, and will now head to Kalamazoo to duel Western Michigan this Friday at 1 p.m. On Friday, the women's track team took on Western Michigan in a dual meet in Kalamazoo. The Eagles beat the Broncos 109-82 in their first neck outdoor meet of the season. Freshman Jessica Harris won the 100-meter dash with a time of 11.85 seconds, while senior Aaliyah McKinney finished right behind her with 11.97. McKinney took first in the 200-meter with a 24.49, while Jenna Wins won the 800 in 2 minutes 15.63 seconds. EMU won a total of 12 events in the meet. Three Eagle women went a little further west, uh, while the rest of the team was in Kalamazoo, to participate in the Stanford Invitational in Palo Alto, California. Junior Alsu Bogdanova set the program record in the 5,000 meter, finishing in 15 minutes, 58.61 seconds, fourth overall in the event. Sophie Galine took 10th in the 3,000 meter steeplechase with a 10.16.90, while Jordan McDermott finished 27th in the 10,000 meter run with a 34.21.18. The team will head to another green and white territory, taking part in the Spartan Invitational in East Lansing this weekend. The spring football game is officially set to kick off in Rhein-Nearsen Stadium this Saturday at 3 p.m. While it's difficult to tell if the team as a whole has actually improved or not, uh, you can watch the offense and defense take to the field for a specialized contest uh, showing Chris Creighton's third generation of Eagles. Admission is free and the gates open at 2 p.m. There will also be a picnic located next to the field. The general cost is $5.75 per person, but the E Gridiron Group will cover any of the costs uh, for any EMU alumni and their families. But wait, there's more. In addition to the spring game, EMU Athletics will host an Adidas Surplus Sale. That's right, EMU will be offering surplus football uniforms, baseball uniforms, and even basketball jerseys. All sales are final, cash or check only. Finally, uh, in the top stories for the week, the EMU men's golf team earned a top 10 finish over the weekend at the Little Rock First Tee Classic, shooting 299, 302, 315 to turn in a 52 over par for the weekend. Senior Brett White, or Brent White excuse me, was Eastern's best individual finisher, shooting an 8 over 224, tying for 10th place. The team will play in the Robert Kepler Invitational in Columbus on April 9th and 10th. We'll be right back um, next week when we host, well, actually, no, we're going to spend, yeah. what, 10 minutes or so yeah. actually talking Talk some, about more fun things. So stay tuned. Yep. We'll be back in, what, 30, 60 seconds? Something like that. Something like that.
In this day and age of compromised accounts and data breaches, having a strong password is not enough to keep you and your personal information safe. Someone who steals your password could gain access to all your data with nothing to stop them. The Eagle Security Package offers Duo, a tool that provides an additional layer of security to your online accounts through two-factor authentication. This means Duo not only uses something you know, your password, but also something you have access to, such as your mobile device. Duo's two-factor authentication gives you the power to keep your data safe, even if your password is lost. Once Duo is set up, you can access protected sites with your login credentials like you normally would, but it will now be preceded by a message sent to your mobile device prompting you to accept or deny the login. If it's you who logged in, hit the green button to accept it, but if it's not you, hit the red button to deny it. By doing so, this extra step will take a forefront stance at protecting your online accounts from being compromised or breached and you'll know right away if an attempt was made. For more information about Duo, please visit tiny.image.edu forward slash Duo. Hi, my name is Shanna Gilkison, and ETV has been a very important part of my life, uh, especially for the last four years. I got my start at ETV in my third semester at Eastern from fellow students, and it's been a great experience. Working with all these new people that I didn't know before, it's very awesome just seeing how willing people are to get together and uh, create something from scratch. I'm Shanna Gilkison for Eastern Weekly, and this is eWalking. I will also be hosting and producing a sort of like a late night style talk show. Everyone that's here wants to be here. They care to be here. They want to work. They want to learn. And with that kind of environment, everybody benefits. I tell you, I've been doing really well, very successful here at Eastern, but it wasn't until I really became part of the ETV club that I really felt like I, I was getting more of what I needed as a student. We decided that we wanted to do things above and beyond uh, our coursework, so um, I was part of founding the ETV Student Org. It just so happened that Shanna was in one of my classes and uh, she told me to come and I showed up and it was very like a very warm welcome like everybody was very nice to me right away and uh, they actually had an idea to make a sitcom or a uh, actually they called it a soap opera at that time and they said they had uh, they weren't sure exactly what they wanted but they wanted one thing they knew that they wanted this guy uh, his name is Ramon to be their main character. I mean, that was kind of how uh, the show Week at a Glance kind of took off. Beyond Eastern's Walls, when I'm done here, I'll probably be working with some people from ATV, again, professionally. And I think a lot of students don't take advantage of what they should with organizations on campus, and ATV is one of the best. And we're back. Uh, we're going to talk for a few minutes. We were going to have a special guest on, uh, but some yes. practice commitments came up. And uh, next week, we're hoping to have Kyle Rhodes of the golf team in studio with us. But uh, in the absence of that, yep. we're going to do what we know best, and that is talk aimlessly about college athletics. Yes. So let's get to it. All right. Let's uh, you know. Let's start with um, the Amy Spring game. Yeah, uh, that's a good place to start, I think. Mm -hmm. um, year three of Chris Creighton's tenure as head coach. Yes. Um, we're basically, we're hopefully going to start seeing really what this team can do, you know, maybe firing on, you know, more cylinders and it looks like it's been firing on the last two. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this, this is about the time when you get to year three of a new coaching regime, which now it's no longer, I guess you would say, new. Um, th that's when you start to see what this guy's recruits are really doing is bringing in a lot of transfers. And more so in the spring game, you look, in my opinion, you look for individual efforts. Because mm -hmm. as we said earlier, or I suppose as I said earlier, you, you can't really tell how good a team actually is when it's playing against itself. Uh, you know, for what it's worth, we saw that last year with the spring game. Offense and defense looked 
pretty good, but then the team struggled throughout um, an overwhelming majority of the season. And so, personally, at the spring game, I'll be there. I'll look for individual efforts from we have quite a few transfers coming in. It'll be interesting to see what goes on at quarterback. Mm -hmm. um, will Brogan Roback be able to hang on to that starting position? And, and, and um, it's a good thing you bring up Brogan Roback. <clears throat> I was talking to uh, one of the football players uh, mm -hmm. who I have a class with yes. um, a couple of weeks ago, and I just asked them, kind of were, you know, in between passing out assignments and stuff like that. So I you know, had a few minutes to talk with them. Mm -hmm. um, so I asked them, I said, you know, how's Brogan looking this spring? You know, because that's mm -hmm. one of the big things I'm looking at in year three is, okay, sure. is he settled in? And, you know, according to this player, you know, he's having a good spring. Mm -hmm. And yeah. being one of those, we, we've, I think, in the past described him as a sort of traditional, his tendency is to be a pocket passer type quarterback. He can run, he's done it, but that's not his preferred method of attack. So I think mm -hmm. as the offensive line improves, Roback will improve as well. And he, we have a much stronger receiver core coming out in this time. Mm -hmm. We have recruits and also transfers. I believe Kevin Davis should be actually taking to the turf yep. now. Um, and so a lot of things to look forward to, but let's get into the schedule then sure. real quick. Coming up, we have Mississippi Valley State here at home to start the season. And that is theoretically a win. That's why I, I you can, bring in the FCS schools. And um, I, that, will, I think that that's what you want. You get your feet wet into the season. And, and that's Everybody our consensus pick. That's you know, fine. Yeah, you win. That's probably granted, the one thing we agree you know, on. Eastern a couple of years ago brought in uh, <laughs> Illinois State as an FCS uh, opponent to start the season, and that didn't go To be so fair, <laughs> F Illinois State is one of the better teams in the F in FCS, mm -hmm. you know, Division One FCS football. Um, True. So uh, there's that, and sometimes it happens. Every now and then, Appalachian State, even though now yep. they play um, FBS ball, at the time when they upset Michigan, mm -hmm. I don't think they did. And so... It happens, but Mississippi Valley State, a win. They then head to Missouri for an, a matchup with the SEC opponent. And we argue over this a lot, but mm -hmm. last year I thought Eastern put forth a heck of an effort against the Tigers. Um, you're not as, oh, no, I'm not as sold on that No, effort, I'm not. I, I think it's one of those that, you know, and we can argue about this until we're blue in the face. <laughs> we have argued about this until we were blue in the face. Um, that. LSU maybe, you know, didn't play up to the level of competition that it thought it needed to play up to, and you can make that argument, you know, that they were sure. being lazy, whatever. But, but this year, you know, LSU isn't the opponent, Missouri is. Right. And they're coming off of, a, you know, an offseason, a very interesting offseason for Missouri, mm -hmm. um, losing their top quarterback uh, due to some disciplinary uh, issues. Yes. Um, so that's going to be a, a, an open game for them. Um, at the quarterback position for Missouri. So any, I think, you know, anything can happen. And when you happen. catch a team early in the season is mm -hmm. your chance for upsets, I think. Um, because teams, right, aren't quite dialed in. They're still working out a lot of things mm -hmm. offensively or defensively. And I think Eastern has a chance to at least hold their own here. Mm -hmm. um, so then you follow that up with the Charlotte 49ers, who last year moved up to FBS football. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they won a single conference game. So it's interesting. I was actually reading a preview for Charlotte, you know, for their season, and they're looking at Eastern Michigan as a win, and Eastern Michigan fans and alumni are looking at Charlotte as a win. Mm -hmm. So it should be an interesting matchup there, but another one that I think Eastern Michigan should come out on top of. Yeah, I think on paper that it, that's one that can go either way at this point. Um, and we'll, you know, a little bit get to our, you know, way through early predictions, uh, <laughs> like a lot of people are starting to do. Um, oh, yes. But that, that game against Charlotte, I think, is a game that'll really, as far as the ninth conference schedule going, uh, is going, with the exception of uh, Wyoming, which we'll talk about next, um, that's the one I think that can end up, you know, going Eastern's way if not so many things that need to go right go right. <laughs> you know, that, that one they can I think skate away with some pretty yep. good, uh, you know, maybe making some mistakes and still come out with one. So then they do follow that up in Week Four with Wyoming, who mm -hmm. the Eagles defeated last season at Wyoming. However. Wyoming was on a third-string quarterback for almost all of that game. So will that situation be resolved this time around? I don't know. But again, that's another winnable game that Eastern Michigan has a chance. You know, really, realistically, you can start 3-1 and one for the season, and they're going to need every one of those wins because do they have a doozy when they start oh, conference no play? No kidding. Um, I believe they start in the... They start with Bowling Green, mm -hmm. I believe, and they follow that up with Toledo, mm -hmm. Western Michigan, or Ohio, and then Western Michigan. All four of those teams were in bowl games last season. Yes. And that is a tough way to start your conference play. Absolutely. And, and something, you know, for Eastern, the 
one of the many things that it struggled with um, the last couple of years is conference play. Um, and you're running the gauntlet, you know, with those four teams to start your conference season in a season that doesn't have a bye week. Um, so going right there, um, Toledo, that's going to be a doozy of a game, like you said. Bowling Green, consistently at the top of the MAC every single year. But Bowling Green, one thing, and Toledo both, um, new head coaches. Um, both of their coaches, uh, Dino Babers for Bowling Green, moved up to Syracuse, uh, taking with him, coincidentally, Mike Hart, who was a running backs coach here at Eastern, uh, not so far in the distant past. Um, so he moved up. Toledo, uh, their coach, Matt Campbell, moved out to Iowa State. So they're both two programs starting fairly fresh. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much of the original system's gonna stay, yeah. um, but they've got some you know, holdover players uh, going into mm -hmm. the next season. So those two games yeah. are gonna be tough. They follow that up then. Um, slight break in the action. Well, I guess every team it can be a struggle in the MAC. It's a volatile conference. But after mm -hmm. that, uh, they face Miami who defeated us last season. That was in Miami though, this time around the Red Hawks come to Ypsilanti, they'll be at the factory. Then Northern Illinois, and lastly, Central Michigan to finish the conference slate. So it's, it's not an easy conference schedule this time around, but this is a team that's uh, theoretically better than last season. So maybe they'll be able to keep up, maybe mm -hmm. not. Um, and, and we both it, agree that there are some you know, improvements that have been made, um, and that's gonna, I th we think both, reflect itself in the record. We don't agree on what the record's gonna look like when the season's over with. Yes. But we both agree at this point that there's going to be an improvement. Um, I'm saying at this point three and nine, which, you know, for Chris yep. Creighton having won three games in his first two seasons, um, you know, a definite improvement. You say three and nine. I pragmatically, I want to say four and eight, but I am a bit of an optimist sometimes mm -hmm. when it when it comes to the football program, especially or most Eastern sports. I say if they're lucky, they can get away with five wins here. You're more solid are the ones I'm more confident in I would say Wyoming Mississippi Valley State Charlotte and Miami mm -hmm. are, are probably your best your best shots there yep. but and I think yeah. I think three and nine you know it's gonna look at like you know two and two heading in the conference play and I think a win against Miami mm -hmm. um, and that'll do it uh, but we'll see again for our yeah. far too early predictions um, a lot can happen between now and August oh, so yeah. um, that pretty much does it uh, for this week. Um, so we'll come back next week when hopefully we have, again, Kyle on the show. Yep. And we're going to say goodbye to uh, one of the hosts here uh, at the table. Um, spoiler alert, it's both of us. Uh, right, so one of the hosts. <laughs> um, but we'll see you soon. Um, have a good break. Uh, see you next week. Stay classy, Ypsilanti. That's my line. <laughs> <laughs>